Hello, and thank you, for, uh, as always, for joining us with uh, Lessons of Vietnam live streaming show where we strive to tell the real story of the Vietnam War. I am your host, Bill Dixon, Vietnam veteran, 67, 68. And just so you know, I have been back on three different occasions. Uh, our show is brought to you by Nissan Communications of Raleigh, North Carolina, with M. Nissan as our engineer and everything else we need to get the Lessons of Vietnam show out to you. Uh, as you can see that information, uh, if you need to contact me with questions, suggestions, or whatever, it's DixonBill80 at yahoo.com. But more important, if you want to be part of the show, ask questions, make comments, or whatever else you want to take, participate in, it's 919-518-9773. Or even better, Computers 2K Voice. 2K Voice. Computers 2K Voice. That's through Skype. All right, before we start the show tonight, I want to uh, thank all the Korean War veterans uh, out there for their service. Uh, not much news coverage on it, but uh, yesterday, the 25th of June, uh, is the 69th year of the beginning of the uh, Korean War when the North Koreans invaded South Korea. So uh, if you know of a Korean veteran out there, uh, tell him thank you for your service and uh, that you remember the anniversary. Uh, not many people did, uh, it, evidently, because I never saw anything on the news about it. That's uh, the Forgotten War, as they say. Uh, the Vietnam vets came home. People were mad with us. They came home from Korea, and people didn't even realize they were gone. They just kind of went right on. Uh, also, the most important part of the show each time is the Veterans Crisis Line here. If you know of a veteran who is in crisis or you are a veteran in crisis, uh, if you know of a veteran, uh, give them this number and, tell, and, and encourage them to reach out to some good people out there waiting to help them out. Uh, there's still about 22 veterans a day who uh, uh, give up on life and, and everything else. And uh, there's someone out there that uh, they're not alone. So uh, call the number and, and, and have, a, have a nice confidential chat with whoever's there. <clears throat> Our show tonight is part two of the secrets and mysteries of the Vietnam War, part two. It's actually the first part of part two. Okay, uh, as as the 50th anniversary is coming along, there's been lots of things that have been declassified that were classified before. So, information is coming out, and uh, this, uh, I guess, during any war, there's always kind of uh, top secret and mystery things that have happened. Uh, unexplained things, as we talked about last time, and tonight there's no difference. We're going to go right into uh, some of the uh, crazy parts of uh, of the Vietnam War. For those of you out there who do, who didn't know, I don't know where you've been that you wouldn't know, but the Vietnam War was not just in Vietnam. It was a war going on in Laos. It was a war going on in Cambodia, and we're going to have those in, on the show on those after a while. Uh, a lot of those wars in Laos and Cambodia were done by special forces and CIA. But uh, the Vietnam War wasn't just in Vietnam. The name for the Veterans War f fails to reflect how much of Southeast Asia it affected. The French had been using Vietnam as a launch point for hostilities against both Burma, now known as Myanmar, and Thailand, previously Siam, until 1939. So it was up unsurprising that, fight, that fighting leaked out of Vietnam's borders. The main reason for this was the Ho Chi Minh Trail, a supply line that stretched along the spine of the entire country that enabled the communist powers in the north to supply the communist guerrillas, the Viet Cong, as we know them, uh, in the south. The, the trail came right on down through north Vietnam, with supplies brought in to uh, China and through China and Russia. Uh, however, most of this road network was actually located in neighboring Cambodia and also ran through parts of Laos. The regular bombing of both countries took place under the orders of American President Johnson in office 1963 to 69 and Richard Nixon from 1969 to 74. But unofficially, we never were in those countries, even though we had soldiers and we had ethnic uh, groups fighting with us there. Uh, you could get killed in Laos and Cambodia just as well as you could get uh, killed in Vietnam. It's just that uh, the general public didn't know anything about it. Unlisted CIA plans, or as we call them, black ops, were also carried out. They were unofficial, as America had never formally declared 
war or confirm to the public that combat operations were taking place in either Cambodia or Laos. Well, when you think about it, Vietnam was never a complainer of war either. So uh, that's some of the CIA working with some of the Hmong uh, guys and, and so forth. So, okay. The trail spanned most of the 900 miles between North Vietnam's capital and the Mekong Delta. That is the Ho Chi Minh Trail. You can see where it uh, wind down and had come off uh, the trail into coming into South Vietnam. Uh, 900 miles, and most of it was made in the beginning by uh, people pushing bicycles and walking. Uh, at the peak of the fighting in Southeast Asia, it provided for hundreds of thousands of regular troops and BC insurgents, plus enough material, fuel, and ammunition to supply the communist war efforts in the South for more than a decade. And you can see you're pushing down the trail. The bicycles will stick out to the side, loaded down. Uh, that wasn't all it was. As it moved on, it got bigger. They would take tree limbs and bend them over and tie them together so you'd almost have a tunnel, and they were running trucks down uh, part of the way. Uh, there were many trails. No, Ho Chi Minh Trail was just not one trail. There were many trails. The Ho Chi Minh Trail was not a single road, but rather a vast web of crisscrossing intersecting pathways, tracks, and thoroughfares totaling 9,500 miles. It snaked down from the north past the DMZ, or as some people call it, like to call it the long way, the demilitarized zone. Uh, some people like to call it the McNamara Line. Uh, and through the dense and rugged forest of neutral Laos and Cambodia, running parallel to the Vietnamese border. I like the word neutral Laos and Cambodia. Uh, want a whole lot of neutrality there. Um, a series of exit roads branched off from the main lines at various points into the South Vietnam. It's from these up opening that infiltrators and supplies poured into the territory controlled by the Saigon government. From the last picture, you saw some of those uh, offsets where they went into South Vietnam. Okay. Built upon rough secret foot and bicycle paths, hacked out of the jungles by Viet Minh forces. Now, Viet Minh forces were the original Viet Cong that was back when they were fighting the French. They were the Viet Minh. Uh, during the early French Indochina uh, War, which goes back to the French again, they started to cut the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Construction of what became the Ho Chi Minh Trail began in earnest in 1959. Hanoi initially dispatched more than 400 engineers and laborers connecting the trails and blazed blaze more pathways southwards. Almost immediately, guerrillas used the network to infiltrate the South Vietnam. By 1961, U.S. intelligence estimated that more than 5,000 insurgents were reaching South Vietnam annually using the route. That's by 1961, and we weren't even there yet, officially. For the next 16 years, work never stopped on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Throughout the 1960s, thousands of engineers toiled in horrendous conditions to widen expand the pathways to accommodate wagons, small vehicles, and even heavy trucks. Alternate and dummy routes were carved out of the jungles to confound American and South Vietnamese intelligence. They had whole villages who lived alongside the road, so if it got bombed, they could come right back in before the bombers even got back to the American bases and start construction on it again. And like I said, they could hide it in so many places, and I guess the dummy roads were out in the opening where people could see and, and bomb them. Prevent the trails from becoming bogged down during the summertime monsoon season. Gravel, corduroy, and even pavement were used along key segments. Early in the war, it could take a VC infiltrator up to six months to travel the trail from north to south by foot. But within a few years, that time was reduced to weeks or even days. Thanks to an innovative and sophisticated system of truck relays organized and run by the 559th Transportation Group, the 24,000-man unit of the North Vietnamese Army assigned to manage the network. 24,000 men assigned to keep the Ho Chi Minh Trail open. Uh, that was serious, and they had relays of trucks and so forth, as you can see. Oh, it's killed some. I'm going backwards or forwards. I lost it. As the work on the trails continues, supply depots, troops, barracks, tunnels, complexes, bunkers, hospitals, and logistical command and control centers known as Bintroms were set up at regular intervals by an army of 40,000 workers. 
twenty some thousand uh, Viet Cong and forty thousand workers, and all it masked in a dense, impenetrable tropical canopy. As you can see there, they even used elephants to uh, go up and down the Ho Chi Minh Trail. In fact, it's been reported that soldiers and vehicles could travel the whole of the network without ever emerging from the cover of the jungle. Entire battalions of North Vietnamese infantry were assigned to defend the route's flanks against enemy recon units, while key areas bristled with anti aircraft defenses. So when you think of trails, it wasn't just a little bicycle trail uh, down there. It was a major, almost a major highway in places. As the war continued, Hanoi used the system to secretly funnel even more men, supplies, and military hardware into South Vietnam. In 1964, as many as 12,000 communist troops and irregulars had infiltrated the enemy territory by the way of trail, while up to 30 tons of supplies a day. Let me read that again. 30 tons of supplies a day were trickling into the south along the jungle pathways. It's hard to say 30 tons of supplies was trickling. Sounds to me like it was flooding. In 1966, between 60,000 and 90,000 combatants had marched south by its roads and pathways in the lead up to 1968 Tet Offensive. The trail enabled the communists to preposition some 200,000 troops and 81,000 tons of weaponry at key points in th South Vietnam getting ready for the Tet Offensive. By the war's end, more than a million tons of material had moved throughout the network. American forces worked ceaselessly to disrupt the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Beginning in 1964, U.S. airplanes hammered its routes around the clock, using everything from A-1 Sky Raiders to B-52 bombers, you can see there. In 1965, as many as 1,000 sorties were flown against key weight points in North Vietnam as well as Cambodia and Laos. By late 1968, that number swelled to more than 500 strikes a day. Now, 500 strikes, and they didn't drop one bomb. So uh, you can figure out how many bombs dropped along the trail in, in a day. As you can see just in that picture right there, there's quite a few bombs there. While the air campaigns hampered the communist supply lines, men and material continued to flow south, mostly under cover of darkness. Efforts to cut the line using ground troops met with only limited success. In other words, what few people we could send into Vietnam uh, didn't seem to make much difference when it's far, as far as stopping the trails and the, uh, the bombing and so forth, just kind of uh, slowed them down in places. With bombing and ground operations having achieved only limited success, the Pentagon began exploring unconventional and sometimes rather outlandish methods of disrupting the Ho Chi Minh Trail. In 1968, U.S. military intelligence now, I'm going to use that military intelligence word loosely as I go into the next couple of paragraphs. Military intelligence dropped 20,000 battery-powered sensors. Some disguise look like animal droppings along the length of the system. And that you can see that there uh, looks like a pile of uh, uh, monkey poop, but it's actually a very highly sophisticated sensor. The small devices could detect sounds and vibrations of any movement, be it human or vehicular. We wired the Ho Chi Minh Trail like a drugstore pinball machine, and we plugged in it every night, said one intelligence official. Signals from the devices were transmitted to recon aircraft, which could then detect direct and airstrike onto enemy troop concentrations. Remember the last show we talked about the rock apes? Could they tell the difference between a person and a rock ape? They also used sensors that uh, could detect ammonia in urine. But trouble was, they couldn't figure out whether it was rock ape urine or tiger urine or elephant urine or person urine. The $1 billion program known as Project Igloo White was considered a waste of time and money and resources. One billion dollars was considered a waste of time, money, and resources. Now you know why you said we're using the word military intelligence lightly. That same year, Air Force, the U.S. Air Force, by the way, undertook an ambitious scheme to literally wash away the trail by way of man-made rainstorms. 
between 1968 and 1972, C-130 transplant planes seeded the clouds over Southeast Asia with rain-producing silver iodide iodide and lead iodide designed to produce torrential downpours. In other words, they wanted monsoons more often than there were monsoons. But the project codenamed Papa did produce higher volumes of precipitation, but the trail still remained open. Finally, there was Project Commander Lava. Now, whatever you're doing, you want to stop whatever you're doing because you want to hear this part. An outlandish scheme in 1967 to drop 120 tons of powdered soap onto the trail. Operation Commando Lava used chemicals to turn the Ho Chi Minh Trail into a muddy swamp following a rainfall. After making contact with the wet ground, the compound would foam up, creating an impenetrable morass of goo. The plant was shelved after the low flying transport used to deposit the mixture fell prey to enemy ground fire. In other words, in order to get it to where it needed to be, they had to fly low and slow. When you fly low and slow, uh, it gives the enemy something to uh, shoot at. So it didn't work. (coughs) By the time the American combat troops were withdrawn from Southeast Asia, the Ho Chi Minh Trail had evolved into a fully paved, four-lane highway that ended just north of Saigon. That is a picture of the Ho Chi Minh Trail today. A four-lane highway. I have seen it. Uh, It's uh, got some beautiful bridges there. In 1969, the Commons had even installed an eight-inch wide plastic pipeline system that pumped fuel to NVA and VC units operating in the south. They had their own gas pipeline. And we can't even run one here in the United States. The supply network was in use right up to the end of the war. In fact, many of the troops and vehicles that encircled and finally overran the South Vietnamese capital moved in from the north along the trail. Now, this is another uh, strange one. Project Eldest Son convert ammo sabotage in Vietnam. The idea of the Eldest Son was not killing a large number of the enemy, but to destroy his confidence. Kind of like the we one we heard the sounds of the uh, Operation Windfall when they had the dead VC come in and, and talk the last show. So we're going to make them scared and, and, and destroy their confidence in the Chinese-made arms and ammunition. Uh, you could definitely tell a difference between the AK-47 made by the Chinese and AK-47 made by the Russians. The AK-47 by the Chinese looks like it may fall apart at any time. After CIA ordinance text proved it was feasible to load a 7.62 uh, 39 millimeter round with high, enough high explosive to drive the boat back into the skull of the soldier firing the weapon, the work of sabotaging thousands of rounds began. It took a month for the CIA to pry bullets from captured ammo, replacing the powder with an identical looking high explosive substitute. Then reseeding the bullet and re- resealed ammo cans and crates so there was no sign of tampering. Okay. Now, when they did that, they only did it to one or two bullets at the time. You know, I mean, a lot of our listeners know that I was in the Israeli military. Yeah. And I remember that we were told to not use U.S. manufacturer uh, ammo. Ammo that was captured from Jordan, from yeah. Egypt, or whatever, because it can blow in your face. Yeah. That was right around 68, 69. Same time the CIA 70, was doing this, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, the sabotage rounds generated up to 250,000 PSI, more than five times the pressure of a normal 7.62 by 39 millimeter round, and enough to blow up the weapon. Several hundred 12.7 millimeter machine gun rounds and nearly 2,000 82 millimeter mortar rounds were booby trapped as well. The latter being designed to explode when they hit the mortar tube's firing pin. Green berets carried booby trapped rounds with them and slipped them into enemy ammunition caches whenever possible. They would also load them into a magazine of rifles found near dead enemy bodies. They were always careful to leave just one round at a time so all the evidence of sabotage would be destroyed 
when the round was fired. When ammo turned up in the front lines, weapons began exploding, killing enemy riflemen and sometimes entire mortar crews. See, they only want to do one or two because if they did them all, then the Viet Cong or the enemy using them would realize, that, hey, somebody's tampered with the information. But if it only happened every now and then, it started running doubt, is my rifle going to explode? So then they start thinking before they fire. Then the second part of Elder Sun kicked in. The dissemination of forged Chinese and NVA documents about the problem as well as U.S. intelligence briefs designed to fall in enemy hands. One bogus enemy report read, We know that it's rumored that some of the ammunition has exploded in AK-47. This report is greatly exaggerated. It is a very, very small percentage of ammunition that has exploded. But they knew. The guys in the field knew it had exploded. And now they're trying to say, well, it didn't happen much. It, they were even armed forces, radio and TV public service amounts about the dangers of using captured weapons due to their faulty metallurgy, which were, of course, meant for the enemies to overhear. So they were telling American soldiers, now don't use the MK-47 because the metal is not good. And they wanted them, the bad guys, to hear it because then they would start thinking, yeah, even the Americans realize it's going to blow up on us. Elder Sun was comprised when it, its details appeared in U.S. press in 1969. In other words, it was a secret. Until the freedom of the press, we deserve to know. The only trouble is the bad guys also learned this. The name was changed to Project Italian Green and later to Pole Bean. And the rest of the ammunition was quickly placed in ammo caches, although without the leave no trace finesse of the eldest son operations. Nonetheless, even when the enemy knew the dump had been tampered with, it was nearly impossible to detect which rounds were booby trapped, so the Italian Green and Pole Beans were successful in sowing seeds of doubt. It can no tell how much the... Uh, disruption we'd have had had the free press not published for the use of the enemy this little detail by the way if you would like to call in and make a comment or ask questions the number is 919-518-9773 or skype computers 2k voice so if you have a question or comments and so forth now this one this is one i asked some nurses not long ago at the symposium we did at the uh uh, at the museum. Now, uh, I warned y'all last show that we're going to get into some, maybe some R-rated stuff. So we're going to start. This is where I'm talking about that this would be for uh, adults of whatever age uh, around. We're probably not going to be talking about something, this one, that young children would be understanding. What we're going to be talking about is the legendary Black Clap legend. From the day I got in Vietnam, they told us to be careful with the Vietnamese girls because you could catch the black clap. And if you got the black clap, you would never go home. Now we're going to talk about it. There were, uh, there were uh, many stories around the belief that they were developing among GIs a certain virulently, yeah. Okay, that's the word, virulently, drug-resistant <laughs> strain of VD that was so lethal that its victims were routinely, through, though very stealthily, transferred to an unnamed island off the coast of South Vietnam. And this, this rumor goes right on today. Upon this island, the infected GI would await excruciating death or miraculous pharmaceutical redemption, whichever arrived first but they won't gonna let you back into you know, good old USA. The island was known as Palo Condori to the French and in the Vietnamese Consun Island. Black crap, the shard of fact that must be present, present in order to qualify the tale as a true legend happens to be fairly easy to verify. Venereal disease was as common in Vietnam as in any other war. The difference apparently was the availability of broad spectrum antibiotics. These multi multivalent drugs were used 
prophylactically by well-meaning corpsmen in the ill-advised belief that they could prevent their buddies from passing on BD to their stateside families simply by giving them one massive dose a day or two before the GI left Vietnam for home. It's kind of like getting a uh, techno shot. Such injections of conscientious of conscious proof, ironically, vengeful. Physicians specialized in infectious diseases have long recognized the ability of disease agents to become violently resistant to even the most powerful antibiotics if the antibiotics are administered in doses that allow the disease agent to build up an intolerance to the drug ruse. And we talk about that every day, how uh, our antibiotics are starting not to work as well because the diseases they're up against are starting to develop so they can't, uh, not doing as much good. That is exactly what happened. And after about 1970, select Asian strains of VD were extremely difficult to cure, even when treated in isolated back in USA medical facilities. However, that certain of these languishing GIs were spirited away to an island to die alone and unmourned is a part of the legend that is lost in a cloud of tense anxiety. Still, it is not hard to imagine a degree of redemptive angers that might build up in the psyche of a 19-year-old GI running, returning home to a nation that suggested to him that he was guilty just for being where he was in the first place. And now he's going to be maybe bringing the disease home. If he bought into such an awful shame, it would seem quite fitting, even logical, that a young man as morally infected as he obviously was would not only be incurable, but he might may made to suffer such vengeful horror in a jail-like setting in an alien nation. This is not a legend. This is some of the re uh, responses I, I got. Um, this is not a legend. The black clap was a real disease that Vietnamese prostitutes were paid to give to American soldiers. Once the soldiers contracted the disease, they had three days to make a decision. That decision was either suicide or operation in which they would eventually be deported to foreign land never to return home again. This was their choice based on the humiliation of returning home with no genitals. I can tell you more, many more details about the disease firsthand experience, but I'm also not out to prove anything. The urban legend folks don't know shit. Okay? This guy says there's no such thing as an urban legend. I'm going to put, put it out there both ways because uh, I have not been able to find anybody to verify it uh, one way or the other for certain. Nope. This is what another one has to say. Nope. It's just an urban legend. All the rumors partially based on real life disease with gonorrhea being the most likely suspect. What is black clap? When people talk about the black clap, they are often referred to as an incurable disease that causes sufferers to break out in infectious sores and boils. Okay. Now, you thought the last one was R-rated. We're going to really get into R-rated now because this was another urban legend. Okay. They, uh, the ladies of the, of the evening, uh, the prostitutes, uh, strategically placed razor blades. And I'm going to leave it up to your imagination where they were supposedly to place the razor blades, but you can see uh, the girls of the uh, the street there uh, trying to, in a Vietnamese soldier trying to negotiate with the uh, American soldiers. Uh, well, we're just going to go right on and and you can think it what you want to. In their vaginas, the Vietnamese prostitutes put razor blades. I hope this was an emergent uh, a legend. I just can't imagine uh, this myth even survived the war. It was said that the agents of the Viet Cong were pretending to be prostitutes and then put blades into their genitals and traumatized trusting American soldiers. And while those bleeding to death rolled on the ground, the women slipped away. The source of this myth is the Japanese legends about ninja women who allegedly put into their vaginas cylinders with poison thorns. The men who risked copulation with them immediately died. Now, I could see pores and thorns, but I could see razor blades. This tells a story that is least unique to the Vietnam War, at least in the context of oral tradition. Accounts told as true from one GI to another concerning the ambiguous 
Vietnamese prostitute with a razor, razor lined vagina were ex, ex, extant for the duration of the war and heard in every sector. I heard about it, never saw anybody uh, that knew anything about it for certain, but I heard it was out there along with everything, a lot of other things. That uh, Listen, if you've ever been in the military, the rumor mill is, uh, well, it just it works well. Now, we're going to go to, uh, this is actually uh, Ike Ad- Ad- Atkinson, also known as A.K. Sergeant Smack. He has a North Carolina tie, and he spent uh, part of his uh, jail time in Central Prison in North Carolina. He was from North Carolina. And, uh, but uh, I'm not going to tell you what he was best known for until we get into it a little bit. The legendary lives and times of the Atkinson Kingpin and his band of, of uh, brothers. And you can get the idea when you had Sergeant Smack, what, what he was known for, but uh, uh, that was just what he was selling, not how he was doing them. Okay. That is there. As a former U.S. Army Master Sergeant, he utilized his intellect and charm to smuggle, by conservative estimates, a thousand pounds of heroin annually from Bangkok, Thailand, through U.S. military bases in the United States from 1968 to 1975. Atkins' legendary enterprise was so complex and profitable, it is a rival of those of modern-day hoodlums, the Black Mafia family. Askin moved to Bangkok, Thailand in the mid-60s and became a partner in Jack's American Star Bar. There he is with the sixes with his uh, afro. Uh, in 1968, it ended into a drug trade from the Golden Triangle through a Chinese tie who was a business partner in Atkinson's bar. Atkinson and his organization brought heroin at about $4,000 U.S. a kilogram and being cut four ways and transported to the United States by military personnel. Flown on U.S. aircraft, the heroin would eventually arrive at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and other military bases and be sold to American distributions for $100,000 a kilo. That's a pretty good markup. Netting a profit of about $96,000 per kilo. Atkins' downfall, though, came in 1975. A shipment of heroin was due to arrive at two addresses in Fayetteville, North Carolina, each belonging to an elderly black woman. An Army serviceman would come to pick up the shipment, saying it had been accidentally delivered to the wrong address. In other words, a serviceman from Fort Bragg would come by the elderly woman's house and said, uh, did you get a shipment for me? It was uh, delivered to the wrong address. Uh, I need to pick it up. And, of course, being an elderly lady it would be, oh, yes, thank you for coming by and getting it. Uh, the plan had worked before, but this time one woman contacted the postal authorities. The other fearing she had been sent a bomb contacted the police. The police, the police found Atkins' palm prints on one of the heron bags and he was arrested on January 19, 1975, in his home in Goldsboro. He was convicted the following year and was sentenced to 31 years in prison. Atkins was released in 2007. Okay. Or according to DEA, Atkinson was in fact the main supplier of heroin to Harlem drug lord Frank Lucas after the two met in Bangkok around 1974. Atkin takes issue with the most famous aspect of Lucas' operation, the, the so-called cadaver connection. Now, there was a movie made about Frank Lucas, and he talks about how Atkinson was supposed to have gotten the heron home, in which heron was, and the, the, was the cadaver connection in which heron was smuggled in the coffins of dead American soldiers come back from Vietnam instead of claiming he smuggled the drugs inside furniture. Now, Remember a while ago when the, when the package was sent to the two old ladies? Well, it, they were taken using furniture because when you left Vietnam, you could take any personal property you had and put it into a container and, and ship it home ahead of you. And you could buy furniture. Uh, the people bought cars in Vietnam. Almost everybody bought a, uh, a real real tape player. I mean, just a 35 millimeter and a real real tape player and about anything else you can think of was bought and shipped back home. But now this uh, uh, Frank Lucas is saying that he was using dead bodies. He was actually hauling out dead bodies and filling it through with heroin and shipping it home. The Godiva Connection was a supposed heroin smuggling operation involving heroin in the American Severance coffin. 
Frank Lucas, one of Ike's partners in the United States, claimed that this is how he smuggled, that Ike smuggled the narcotics out of Thailand. Ike flew a country boy, North Carolina carpenter, over to Bangkok. We had him make up 28 copies of the government coffins, except we're fixed in with false bottoms, big enough to load up with six, maybe eight kilos. It had to be snug. You couldn't have uh, you couldn't have shit sliding around inside. Ike was very smart because he made sure we used heavy guys' coffins. He didn't put them in so in no skinny guys. This was a statement made by a Harlem drug supplier and partner of Atkinson's Frank Lucas, and it was stated this is what he was stated in when it was in the movie. But Atkinson, who used his lifelong friend Leon as the carpenter, claims he never used coffins to smuggle in heroin. It is a total lie that's fueled by Frank Lucas for a personal gain. Now, I, several years ago, I saw an interview of Atkinson, and he still swears he did not send it home in coffins. It is a total lie that is fueled by Frank Lucas for personal gain. I never had anything to do with transporting heroin in coffins or cadavers. He, Leon, never had any association with constructing of coffins for transporting heroin or drugs. On the contrary, Leon was in Bangkok hauling out teak furniture. One time when I was in Bangkok, Frank came to visit. We used teak furniture to smuggle the heron and we're getting a shipment ready. Frank barged in and went right back, right to the back. What are you doing? Frank asked me. I was caught off guard and didn't want to know him to know I was moving drugs. The only thing I could think of to say was we are making coffins. That's, where, that's a quote from Ike Atkinson. On the bogus heroin cadaver connection from, uh, from like Ike Atkinson, why would I do something so awful as moving heroin and cadavers? I had so much easier and more effective ways of moving my dope. Besides, whatever wrong I did, I was still proud of my military service and I would not have done nothing to harm the memory of our brave soldiers who, who died in serving their country. Even now, there's controversy over whose story was right and what was wrong. In the movie, American Gangster, Ike Atkinson appears as the minor character, Nate, who is depicted as gangster Frank Lucas's cousin and as the drug trafficker who helped Lucas establish the Asian heroin pipeline through Thailand to the United States. These were two of the many of Lucas's lies exposed in Strategic Media Books, LLC's recent release award-winning book, Sergeant Smack. And you saw the cover, I uh, suggest that you go out to Amazon or your local bookstore and pick up uh, Sergeant Smack, The Legendary Lies and Times of Ike Atkinson, King Penis Band of Brothers by Ron Chepswick. Sorry, Ron. Uh, I'm not real good at pronouncing things, and uh, we're going to say that Chepswick is about as good as I can get. The American gang- Gangster movie is a fair- fairy tale told by Hollywood, Chepswick said. It should have been produced by Walt Disney. In a documentary, Atkin tells his own story and further sets the record straight. The, according to him, he sets the record straight. The former kingpin who operated the largest drug smuggling enterprise in the 1970s talks about growing up in rural South. His life in the military is a gambler and a hustler. His rise and fall is a big-time drug dealer. His relationship with Frank Lucas, the 32 years he spent in prison in his life, in his life since his release. Those who have appreciation for the truth will want to listen closely and take note as the real gangster at long last speaks out. It's been really gratifying to get my true story both told both in print and on the screen, Atkinson revealed. The DVD com- complements the book together to provide a complete picture of my life. So that is the uh, true story, according to Ike, about the uh, cadaver connection. Atkinson had a remarkable life as an adventurer, gambler, and drug trafficker. He never carried a gun, never committed murder, or never bowed down to the inf- infamous La Costa Nostra, La Costa Nostra, uh, the Italian mafia. Uh, Atkinson was the first African American drug pin kingpin to have a DIA task force set up specifically to bring him down. Did Ike Atkinson use casuals in the Vietnam War to deliver his drugs? One thought. Excuse me. 
a coffin would not have been sent to the LA ladies in Fayetteville. I'll try to keep my voice for the next few minutes. Or does it matter? He was a drug supplier, not exactly a hero in the first place. So, Remembering the doom flight of, 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 of Operation Babylift, the long war in Vietnam was coming to an end. In the midst of the political fallout, the United States government announced an unusual plan to get thousands of displaced Vietnamese children out of the country. Because, as we were mentioning a while ago, uh, wherever you go, wherever they you go, there was um, keep keep going a little bit more, one a couple more, right there. All right, uh, when the American soldiers and the Vietnamese uh, ladies got together, uh, they produced uh, uh, an admiration child, part Asian, part uh, American child, and those children were. Um, not exactly recognized as being uh, uh, a wanted child. Quite often, they were tr uh, treated and uh, uh, ostracized from the villages and so forth. Well, to help out with some of that problem, President Ford directed that money from a special foreign aid children's fund be made available to fly 2,000 South Vietnamese orphans to the United States. It came to be known as Operation Baby Lift. The first plane to leave as part of that mission took off on April 4th, 1975, just weeks before the fall of Saigon and the end of the Vietnam War. But shortly into the flight, a malfunction forced the pilot, Captain Dennis Bud Trainer, to crash line the C-5 cargo plane in a nearby rice paddy. There's the, the crash plane. Our air photographs of the 1970 crash of the first Operation Baby Lift flight was taken by a person aboard an Air America rescue helicopter. The undeveloped film was given to the pilot, Captain Bud Trainer, before he left uh, Saigon. You can see it scattered all over every place. The, fr the flight deck separated from the plane in the crash. That's, you can see that kind of see in the bottom there. Uh, I believe that's the cockpit. The plane went down in a rice paddy just a couple miles from Saigon, killing 138 of more than 300 on the board. There was a lot of nurses and volunteers along with the children on there. Trainer was charged with carrying hundreds of children, many under the age of two, and so small they had to be carried on the plane. He actually helped carry some of them on the plane. We bucket brigaded, loaded the children right onto the right up the stairs of the airplane, Trainer remembers. When the plane's cargo doors malfunctioned, they were blew out, taking with them a chunk of the tail. Now, there was a lot of controversy of whether that plane, cargo plane door, was booby trapped to blow up. Uh, I'm not certain if anybody ever come up with the real reason why there was sudden malfunction. Uh, maybe someday it'll be more declassification and we'll know more about it. But right now, uh, it happened. There was a rapid decompression inside the aircraft. It cut all control cables to the tail, explains Trainer. So I'm pulling and pulling and pulling, and my nose is going down further and further, and we're going faster and faster and faster, and I can't figure this out. Trader managed to stabilize the plane and turn it back towards Vietnam, or Saigon, really, since he was still in Vietnam. After that, his only option was crash landing. The impact was fierce. We came to a stop, and I thought to myself, I'm alive. He says, and so I undid my lap belt, fell to the ceiling, rolled, I opened the side window and stepped out and saw the wings burning. And I thought, oh no, that's the rest of the airplane. Out of the more than 300 people on board, the death toll included 78 children and about 50 adults, including Air Force personnel. More than 170 survived. So we we're on the plus side of the luck there, but unfortunately, those people who were downstairs didn't have much of a chance. As you can see, the children lined up in the beds there, um, had it was strapped in and so forth, but that was pretty much uh, obliterated when they hit the ground. Colonel Regina Ahn was first, first, a first lieutenant in the Air Force during Operation Baby Lift. I will never forget that day, says Ahn. It's so, as fresh to me right now as it was the day it happened. 
Children loaded tutu to each seat in the troop compartment, she says, but there wasn't enough room for everyone. Those who didn't fit were to make the trip in the cargo area. We put them in little groups and we secured them to the floor of the aircraft with cargo tie down straps and litter straps and blankets and pillows and whatever we could find to secure them to the floor, On says. When the cargo doors blew out, On could see the South China Sea through the hole in the back. When the plane crashed, the impact split the aircraft apart. I remember thinking about this plane. The pl- this plane is crashing and I'm going to live. Am I going to live through it? And I have to figure out how to take care of everybody once we finally come to a complete stop, On says. The cargo compartments carrying children, civilians, and crew members was crushed, but the troop compartment was largely intact. On and other crew members carried the surviving children off what was left of the airplane. Training the arm were honored by the military for their actions that day. They both stayed in the Air Force, built careers and families. Still, each felt uh, felt pulled back to 1975, what, wondering what happened to the children who had survived. And that's uh, the picture of the plane someone took of them. Uh, you can see uh, some of the baby things and so forth laying around. Aaron Lockhart was born in Vietnam, born in Vinh Long, Vietnam, and raised primarily in Northern Virginia and was one of the survivors from the Operation Babylift crash. Lockhart was one of the children aboard the flight. At least that's what she believes based on her research and what her adoptive parents told her about her origins. As she did more digging, she found a news article about On. More than 20 years after the crash, Lockhart called On. And then she told me who she was, and I was just overwhelmed, On said. I was just speechless. I remember thinking I must have held Aaron in my arms because every single one of those babies that was upstairs, I had held in my arms for just a fleeting minute. If Aaron was upstairs, then I held her, and now she is talking to me as an adult. It's hard to explain how overwhelming that was for me. On was able to help fill in the gaps of that day for Lockhart. After that phone call, their lives became intertwined. They even traveled together to Vietnam and returned to the crash site. Trainer was also trying to make his own connections, and with social media, he saw an opportunity. He started a Facebook group for survivors of the C-5 crash, and soon more than 200 survivors and family members had joined. They now hold reunions. Ann and Lockhart have both been to these reunions. Recon- reconnecting with other survivors has helped on move past some of the trauma of that day. When I listen to them talk about their stories, and believe me, they are not all Cinderella stories. What I sense was their gratitude, their gratefulness for being alive and for giving the opportunities they were given, she says. So that helped temper some of the sadness and sorrow and grief. And you can see there, they wrote a book together, Operation uh, Baby Lift, Mission Accomplished. Ann Lockhart and Colonel Regina Ahn also wrote a book and their experience, Operation Baby Lift and Mission Accomplished. Operation Baby Lift was one of the largest rescue efforts in history. Even after the turbo crash of the first flight, those involved were determined to accomplish their mission. More than 3,000 infants and children were airlifted out of Vietnam between April 4th and April 19th, 1975. Now, originally, they were going to get out 2,000, and even after the turbo crash, they got out 3,000. The time they spent in the care of the Special Task Force volunteers at Clark Air Force Base averaged between 12 to 24 hours when they were brought back to the United States. This permitted each child to receive the necessary vaccinations and nourishment and nurturing before continuing long trips to the Pacific, across the Pacific. Even every incoming child and infant were assigned to a surrogate mom. Each was cared for until it was time to board the next flight, the next leg of the journey to a new life. For many children swept up in the evacuation of Vietnam, appropriate documentation was one of the casualties of Operation Baby Lift. And it created uh, lots of problems. According to the 1976 report recorded in Des Moines Register, a year after they were arrived by plane load from embattled South Vietnam, hundreds of Operation Baby Lift children remain under murky legal status in this country. The Americans who took the young refugees into their homes were uncertain about whether the children are really theirs to keep and rear. Remember the boat people coming across and so forth. 
During the 1980s, there was a widely reported case class action lawsuit in the state of California filed against President Ford, Henry Kissinger, and others challenged that many of the children taken from South Vietnamese against the wills of the parents. And I apologize for the breaks here. Uh, this lawsuit caused delays in citizenship processing for some of the adopting families. Their children had entered the United States on a parolee visa that had been signed by President by Gerald Ford. But despite the disorder, the documentation surrounding some adoptions, most were completely completed without hindrance. In other words, uh, nobody asked questions when they got the children from the orphanages. Uh, where those children came from, whether they had families or not. They got them on airplanes to get them out, and they got here, and they were trying to adopt them out, and some of them were almost kidnapped from uh, from Vietnam, so they may have families and so forth, uh, but was, the idea was to get them out and save their lives. Australians adopted many Operation Baby Lift infants and children, in Harvey reported in his 1983 study of the adoptive families, once the news of the impending evacuation of Vietnamese children became known in Australia, there was a rush of adoptive applications. On their arrival, he wrote, most of the airlift children were suffering from some illness, trauma, malnutrition, or other deprivation. Harvey's study concluded that by the third year after adoption, the pedi pediatricians noted that most of the adoptees had become stable in health. Secure with their families and exhibited behavior acceptable for children, children of that age. Question one. Was the door opening in flight sabotaged as thought by some? Two. What happened to the children whose parents later escaped and came to the United States? Three. Why was there so much controversy about bringing the children to the United States and other countries for adoption? Okay, uh, this is uh, starting another one. I'm going to save this one because it gets a little bit longer than we have time for. Uh, our next show, by the way, is going to be, I'm going to hold this up so you can see it. Uh, you can figure out what kind of cancer that is if you can read it better than I can. I cannot pronounce it. I'm not even going to try to pronounce it. Uh but is uh, caused by a fluke acquired while doing your service in Vietnam. Uh, Vietnam veterans with chlorogenia car carcinoma, whatever it is. Okay, uh, we're going to have uh, Doctor uh, Kyle Horton, MD, MBA, internal medicine physician, public policy advocate, uh, veterans and environment. She's going to be coming on the show, talking about uh, this fluke and how it has been in your body for all these years, 45, 50 years, has been in, involved in your body growing, uh, having babies, and so forth. It causes a, um, a, liver, a liver cancer. Uh, there is no test for it. Uh, there, is, there is possibility it's showing up with an MRI if you tell the doctor in advance there's a possibility that it's there. Uh, because most MIRs do not cover that part. It, um, like I said, it's a fluke. It clogs up your uh, uh, liver, dial, uh, bucks and ducts, and so forth. Uh, it mostly comes from uh, undercooked fish and shrimp or uh, so forth. We talked to her about um, the possibility of most of us who are out in the field uh, drink a lot of river water there and. Uh, we put the halogen tablets and shook it up, and I understand that someone, one of the GIs, uh, after he put his two halogen tablets in there and shook it up, he sent a sample home, and they come to find out when he got, got the report back, it was still full of all kinds of parasites and so forth. So you may have picked up something from the water, but if you ate off the economy, if, if you went by Mama Son's uh, local restaurant there, uh, which was basically a cooking pot and a pan, uh, and you ate some fish, along with your rat burgers and so forth, uh, there's a good chance that you may have acquired this fluke. Uh, it's not really recognized right now as it needs to be by the VA, which she's going to be talking about and how it's tested and so forth. But that is a, uh, you know, Vietnam is the war that keeps right on giving between Agent Orange to the veterans, now Agent Orange to our children, Agent Orange to our grandchildren, and now this nice fluke that's coming out 
Uh, Vietnam is a war that keeps right on giving. Uh, I don't think any other wars had all these extras uh, coming out. But that's going to be our next show. I, I can't believe it. That is July 10th. July 10th. July. We just got into June last week. Uh, again, I hope you enjoyed tonight's show. Uh, our next LV show will be July 10th. And as I said, we'll have our special guest, Dr. Kyle Horton. And if you know a Vietnam veteran out there, please encourage them to uh, tune in and listen. She's going to be putting out a lot of good information. If you take down the number 919-518-9773 or by Skype Computers 2K Voice, you'll be able to ask her questions or make comments or uh, get some clarification and so forth. She will be available for uh, questions and, and so forth. So uh, be sure and write that down. That is July 10th. That's about two weeks from now. So um, be sure to make note and tell all the Vietnam vets uh, that you know about the uh, possibility of, of being fluked. Uh, also, I want to remind you that uh, we have a special holiday coming up. I hope you have a wonderful and safe uh, 4th of July. Uh, be careful with those fireworks out there. They had a report tonight on how many fingers have been lost over the last uh, fireworks each year. So, And also take time to ch tell your children uh, what Independence Day means. That will be July 4th, but I'm going to tell you a little other things that are going on. If you're in the, uh, in the Triangle area, the first Monday of the month, Wake Forest has a uh, flag raising uh, a ceremony where they raise the flag of a, a veteran of any war uh, up at the city hall. It flies at the city hall for 30 days. Now, July 1st would be Monday, uh, this coming Monday, and they will be flying a flag of a veteran, but they will also be taking down a flag of a father and son. They will take those flags down. They will present those to the mayor who will present those to the family of uh, the veteran and the son. This is the first time we've ever done a, a son and family together. But that is at uh, 11 o'clock at the um, downtown at the capital of uh, Cary. <coughs> Let me back, back up. That was Wake Forest. July 6th, if you're in the Triangle, will be the monthly POWMIA ceremony held at the um, state capitol building. So I encourage you to do, go into any of those. <coughs> Sorry about that, folks. I'm don't mean to cough on you. I hope I'm not being able to turn it down a little bit. Uh, to develop this strange cough in the last few days. Anyway, he tells me I got to keep right on moving along. But that is pretty much uh, what I want to tell you about. Uh, enjoy the fourth. Uh, don't take a fifth on the fourth. Uh, be careful with the fireworks, especially if you're going to take a fifth. Uh, Flag Day, uh, Wake Forest, eleven o'clock on uh, Monday. Uh, POW ceremony at 12 o'clock at the state capitol, July 6th. And, of course, the 10th Lessons of Vietnam show will be back with the uh, flukes of Vietnam. Thank you very much, and you have a great remainder of June, what's left. Also, I just want to tell you one more thing. On August 17th, the Triangle Purple Heart Dinner is still available if you're in the Triangle. If you need more information and so forth, call us back on the next show or, or uh, get in touch with me at uh, dixonbill80 at yahoo.com, and I'll get you the information sent to you. Uh, we're running out of time, so you have a good remainder, and God bless you. You are tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. If you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it in the archive section at nissancommunications.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Sponsored by Telestream's Wirecast Software, StreamingGear.com, Carolina Apparel, and DeltaForce.net.